Hello again, so we will be continuing reading. I am Malala. This week we're going to read chapters 3 through 5. So what I want you to do is I want you to pull up your 3 through 5, chapters 3 through 5 quiz, and answer the questions along with me as we read this book. So I'll be stopping again like we did last time. Chapter 3, A Magic Pencil. By the time I was 8 years old, my father had more than 800 students in three campuses. An elementary division in two high schools, one for boys and one for girls. So our family finally had enough money to buy a TV. That's when I became obsessed with owning a magic pencil. I got the idea from Shakalaka Boom Boom, the show Safina and I watched after school. It was about a boy named Sanju who could make anything real by drawing. If he was hungry, he drew a bowl of curry, and it appeared. If he was in danger, he drew a policeman. He was the little hero, always protecting people who were in danger. At night I would pray. God, please just give me Sanju's pencil. I won't tell anyone. I'll just leave it in my cupboard. I will use it to make everyone happy. As soon as I finished praying, I would check the drawer, but the pencil was never there. One afternoon, the boys weren't home, and my mother asked me to throw away some potato peels and eggshells. I walked to the dump, just a block or so from her house, wrinkling my nose as I got close, swatting away flies and making sure I didn't step on anything in my nice shoes. If only I had Sanju's magic pencil, I would erase it all. The smell, the rest, the giant mountain of rotting food. As I tossed her rubbish onto the heap, I saw something move. I jumped. It was a girl my age. Her hair was matted and her skin was covered in sores. She was sorting rubbish into piles. One for cans, one for bottles. Nearby, boys were fishing in the pile for metal using magnets on streams. I wanted to talk to them, but I was scared. Later that day, when my father returned home, I told him about the children at the dump. I dragged him to see them. He spoke gently to the children, but they ran away. I asked him why they weren't in school. He told me that these children were supporting their families, selling whatever food they found for a few rupees. If they went to school, their families would go hungry. As we walked back home, I saw tears on his cheeks. Question number one. Why were the other children going through the dump? So go ahead, answer that question, and come back. I believe there is something good for every evil. That every time there's a bad person, God sends a good one. So I decided it was time to talk to God about this problem. Dear God, I wrote in the letter, Did you know there are children who are for forced to work in the rubbish heap? I stopped. Of course he knew. Then I realized that was his will, that I had seen him. Seen them. He was showing me what my life would be like if I couldn't go to school. Until then, I had believed a magic pencil could change the world. Now I knew I would have to do something. I didn't know what it was, but I asked God for the strength and courage to make the world a better place. I signed my letter, rolled it up, tied it to a piece of wood, placed a dandelion on top, and floated it in a stream that flows into the Swat River. Surely God would find it there. As much as I wanted to help the children from the dump, my mother wanted to help everyone. She had started putting bread crust in a bowl on the kitchen windowsill. Nearby was an extra pot of rice and chicken. The bread was for the birds. The food was for a poor family in our neighborhood. I asked her once why she always gave food away. We have known what it is like to be hungry, Pichot, she said. We must never forget to share what we have. So we shared everything we had. We even shared our home with a family of seven who had fallen on hard times. They were supposed to pay my father rent, but more often than not, he ended up lending them money. And although my father's school wasn't really making a profit, he gave away more than a hundred free places to poor children. He wished he could have given away more. My mother, meanwhile, started serving a few girls breakfasts at her house each day. How can they learn, she said, if their stomachs are empty? One day I noticed that some of our longtime students had not returned. I asked my father where they were. Oh, Johnny, he said, some of the richer parents took their children out of the school when they found out they were sharing classrooms with their sons and daughters. Yeah, with the sons and daughters of people who clean their houses or wash their clothes. I was young, but I was old enough to feel that wasn't right and to understand that if too many students left, too many paying students left, it would mean hard times for the school and for our family. What I didn't know was that a bigger threat was looming. Not just for our family and our school, but for all of Pakistan. Question number two. What did Malala feel that wasn't right? So on this one, you're going to restate the question and your answer. 
you're going to use correct capitalization and punctuation, use a complete sentence, and provide evidence for your answer. So the beginning of your question should sound something like, Malala felt that blank wasn't right because, and then finish the sentence. So go ahead, restate the question, capitalization, punctuation, complete sentence, and evidence. Four things. So go write one sentence or two. It's up to you. Um, providing an answer for that question. And with that, we'll move on to chapter four. A warning from God. One autumn day when I was still in primary school, our desk started to tremble and shake. Earthquake, we yelled. We ran outside, some of us falling as we crowded through the narrow door and gathered around our teachers for safety and comfort. Like chicks around a mother hen. A few of the girls were crying. We lived in a region where earthquakes happened often, but this felt different. Even after we returned to the class, the buildings continued to shake. The rumbling didn't stop. Miss Olfat, my all-time favorite teacher, told us to stay calm. She assured us that it would soon be over. But when another strong earthquake hit, within a few minutes of the first, the students were sent home. When I arrived home, I found my mother sitting in the courtyard, where she felt safest because there was no roof above her. She was reciting holy verses verses from the Holy Quran as tears streamed down her face. The aftershocks kept coming and continued past nightfall, and every time they did, my mother ran outside and insisted we go with her. My father told her not to upset the children, but we were already upset because the ground was shaking. The earthquake of I October 8, 2005 turned out to be one of the worst in history. It was a 7.6 on the Richter scale and was felt as far away as Kabul and Delhi. Aftershocks continued for at least a month. Our city of Mingora was largely spared, but the northern areas of Pakistan, including our beloved Shangla, were devastated. Question three, how big was the earthquake that hit on October 8th, 2005? So they just said it was a what on the Richter scale. So go ahead and answer that question and come back real quick. When we finally heard from our family and friends there, they said they had thought it was the end of the world. They described the roar of rocks sliding down hills and everyone running out of their houses, reciting the Holy Quran, the screams as roof, roofs crashed down, and the howls of buffaloes and goats. They were terrified. And then when the destru destruction stopped, they waited for help. The government was slow to arrive, but help came Im immediately from rescue workers from a conservative religious group called TNSM or the Movement for the Enforcement of Islamic Law, led by Sufi Muhammad and his son-in-law, Mulana Fazlullah. Eventually, the government tried to help, and aid 